my night to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree, his body bowed. His body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by heavy stone. Messiah still and all alone. Oh, pray. Praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. Then on the third at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, chapel dust, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Oh, praise, and oh, praise. shall return he shall return in robes of white the blazing sun shall pierce the night and I will
morning, Franklin Baptist Church Farnell, and welcome to our service this week. Now, you'll notice that we're not live streaming today, and that is unfortunately unforeseen circumstances totally out of our control, and we just had to do the best we could with the circumstances we had. Sasha's preaching this morning, and I am so looking forward to what she's going to say. I've heard a bit of it and I'm quite excited. I hope you're going to enjoy it with me. Just a quick reminder, if you haven't heard about it or read about it on Facebook or in the weekly Farno News, we have a get together this afternoon on the beach, but more about that at the end of this service. So just again, a shorter service this week due to those circumstances I told you about. I'd like to call us all into a place of worship with the following reading from Psalm 36, from verse 5 through to verse 12. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies, your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O oh God. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you, let me say that again, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. Continue your love to those who know you, your righteousness to the upright in heart. May the foot of the proud not come against me, nor the hand of the wicked drive me away. See how the evildoers lie fallen, thrown down, not able to rise.
It is time for celebrations. Celebrations is a time when we celebrate all the different things that are happening in our church whānau. From engagements, birthdays, anniversaries, to prayers being answered, and incredible things that God is doing in our, our world, in our community. We love to celebrate with you. So this week, we have an awesome birthday to celebrate in the form of two gorgeous little humans who are turning one. So happy birthday to Ezra and Violet Stevens. They turn one this week. And Emily and Dave, you made it through the first year. Well done, you are absolute rock stars. And we also want to celebrate Sandra and Titus Bruin this week as they celebrate their 33rd wedding anniversary. Congratulations, you two. Um, if you have something you want to celebrate, please don't hesitate to send it in to celebrations at fbc.nz. Awesome. Have a great week. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever sing. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes. Build my 
Kia ora te whanau. It is so good to be back uh, together. Um, I'm so excited about the next two weeks. We will be spending uh, two weeks exploring the Book of Ruth. And I don't know about you, but I love this book. I think it is fair to say that I probably love it um, much more than any of you because I've read it so many times. <laughs> it is probably my most read book in the Bible. And why, may you ask, uh, is this book my favourite? It's not because of the rich storytelling or the incredible message that God is revealing, although that's good. It is purely because my middle name is Ruth. <laughs> so all through my childhood, I always gravitated to this book. I read it so many times, but it wasn't until last year um, that I began to see the depths of this book. Before I go any further, let's pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, God, I know that I cannot reach the hearts of your people alone. In fact, I can't at all. Lord, I need your words to breathe through me. Lord, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds to hear the piercing word from you today. Lord, I pray that it would transform us. In your precious name. Amen. I was privileged to take an Old Testament course at Kiri last semester. And... I got to get a few wee tips from my lecturer about how to read Old Testament narratives, which is what Ruth is. Um, so here is tip number one. Old Testament narratives offer us complex characters living in a complex world. They invite us to ponder, investigate, dig deeper. Almost no, nobody comes off unflawed in these stories, so be curious as you read them and ask questions. <clears throat> the book of Ruth is surprisingly deep and complex, as I just said, but in the best way. It is about an average Moabite woman named Ruth. And fun fact, this is the only book in the Old Testament named after someone who isn't an Israelite. Essentially, chapter one begins with giving us a whole lot of context. So I'm going to briefly fill you in on the first chapter. But before I do that, pull out your Bibles so that you can follow along with me. It will be better that way. So um, grab your phone and pull up your Bible app or, you know, the real paper one, either one. But we're starting at the beginning of Ruth at chapter one. <clears throat> When we arrive in the story, we meet a family, husband, wife, and two sons. There are many names in this story, but the one you need to know right now is Naomi, the wife. The family are leaving Bethlehem to move to the country of Moab because there is a famine in the land. The country of Moab is known to be an enemy of Israel, uh, and the women were considered to be somewhat promiscuous, but I think probably in general it would be kind of considered that um, the Israelites saw Moabites as, as bad people. Keep that in mind as we read through this story. Firstly, Naomi's husband dies. Then the two sons uh, marry Moabite woman, one named Orpah, and one named Ruth. And then sadly, tragedy strikes again 10 years later, and Naomi's sons also die. So it's a bit bleak at this point. Then Naomi gets word from home that God has come to the aid of the Israelites and provided food for them. So Naomi, Ruth, and Orpah begin their journey back to Bethlehem. I love this next part. They've begun their walk down, who knows how far they've gone. Um, they would have prepared everything for walking for a few days. Um, they would have prepared food, had their belongings, um, and they end up having this dispute on the road. Uh, basically, an argument about whether the ladies should come or not. Perhaps Naomi's nervous 
nervous about taking Moabite women back to her home because of their reputation. But really, we don't know the reason. Why is Naomi hesitant? We'll never know. But in the end, Ruth makes this really amazing speech. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. So after that, <laughs> Ruth continues on the journey, but Orpah returns to Moab. Naomi's arrival in Bethlehem creates quite a stir, actually, and she tells everyone that she has a new name, which means bitter, because she believes that God has afflicted her. So up to this point, we've met two significant figures, Naomi and Ruth. So at this point, it is time for tip number two on how to read narrative stories in the Old Testament. Old Testament narratives are told by an all-knowing narrator who likes to conceal just as much or more than they reveal. But in chapter two, when it opens with the narrator, they actually reveal something to us that isn't known to the characters. So you and I get an early insight. The narrator reveals that Naomi has a relative an honourable man named Boaz. Let's continue reading from Ruth 2.2. 2. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, Let me go to the fields and pick up the leftover grain behind anyone in whose eyes I find favour. Naomi said to her, Go ahead, my daughter. So she went out, entered a field, and began to glean behind the harvesters. As it turned out, she was working in a field belonging to Boaz, who was from the clan of Elimelech. So we now know Ruth is working in the field of a relative of her husband's, and we know that Boaz is a good man, but Ruth still doesn't know any of this. So let's carry on at verse 4. Just then, Boaz arrived from Bethlehem and greeted the harvesters. The Lord be with you. The Lord bless you, they answered. Boaz asked the overseer of his harvesters, Who does that young woman belong to? The overseer replied, She is the Moabite who came back from Moab with Naomi. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the harvesters. She came into the field and has remained here from morning till now, except for a short rest in the shelter. So this might seem a bit strange to us, a woman just turning up at a local field and taking some of the harvest that has been missed or dropped. But the Jewish law that Boaz would have known really well gives very clear instructions. So listen up Lorna, I know you're going to love this because um, this focuses on Leviticus, which is your favourite book. So Leviticus 19, 9-10 says, When you reap the harvest of your land, do not reap to the very edges of your field, or gather the gleanings of your harvest. Do not go over your vineyard a second time, or pick up the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 24, 19 basically says exactly the same thing as well. The Jewish law allowed for those who were poor, foreign, oppressed, for all of them to gather whatever was dropped in the harvest process. So let's continue at verse 8. So Boaz said to Ruth, My daughter, listen to me. Don't go and glean in another field, and don't go away from here. Stay here with the woman who worked for me. Watch the field where the men are harvesting and follow along after the woman. I've told the men to not lay a hand on you. And whenever you are thirsty, go and get a drink from the water jars the, man, the men have filled. All I can say after reading this is 
Balkis is a really good man. He is incredibly kind to Ruth. And then in verse 10, it says, At this, she bowed down with her face to the ground. She asked him, <clears throat> Why have I found such favour in your eyes that you notice me, a foreigner? Oh, I can feel the anguish in that. Boaz replied, I've been told all about what you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of her husband how you left your father and mother and your homeland and came to live with a people you didn't know before. May the Lord repay you for what you have done. May you be richly rewarded by the Lord, the God of Israel under whose wings you have come to take refuge. May I continue to find favour in your eyes, my Lord, she said. You have put me at ease by speaking kindly to your servant, though I do not have the standing of one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come over here, have some bread and dip it in the wine vinegar. And when she sat down with the harvesters, he offered her some roasted grain. She ate all she wanted and had some left over. As she got up to glean, Boaz gave orders to his men. Let her gather among the sheaves and don't reprimand her. Even pull out some stalks for her from the bundles and leave them for her to pick up. And don't rebuke her. So Ruth gleaned in the field until evening. Then she threshed the barley she had gathered and it amounted to about an ephah or a bushel of barley. <laughs> Not that I'm a person who knows much about harvesting barley. Um... But I think it was probably a fair amount. <clears throat> How incredible is Boaz? He didn't just meet the requirements of the law. He massively exceeded them. He saw the law and raised it in leaps and bounds. All that were, was required of him to let, was to let her collect the dropped barley. But instead, he gave her the freedom to keep collecting. He protected her from the men. He offered her water, food, and then he allowed her to gather the good stuff, the good barley, and even ordered the men to remove some of the stalks from the harvested, the harvested bundles to leave for her. What an outstanding guy. His generosity and kindness would surely have been somewhat overwhelming to Ruth in this foreign land, which clearly it was when she bowed down before him. When I was in class and we were reading this passage, I was sitting there recalling the Levitical law that we'd learnt the previous week. I couldn't help but notice that there were several laws that Boaz exemplifies in this passage. I've already mentioned a couple of them. I was so excited to hear that Ruth is often considered to be a commentary of the law. So here's another one from Leviticus 19, 33 to 34. When an alien resides with you in your land, you shall not oppress the alien. The alien who resides with you shall be to you as the citizen among you. You shall love the alien as yourself, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. <clears throat> what Boaz is doing is a reflection of what is asked of God's people and how they are to live out the law. I'm not sure if you remember... But the name of this mini-series is to bless the nations. The phrase comes from Genesis 12, where God calls upon Abraham, his descendants, and his descendants to play an active role in God's mission. This is what it says in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. 
I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. The Israelite people are a people chosen by God to be a vehicle of blessing to all the nations of the earth. And here in Ruth, we see Boaz, an Israelite, a man who is called to be a blessing to the nations, being a blessing to the nation of Moab, through being a blessing to Ruth, a Moabite woman. He elevates her through his kindness and compassion. Eventually, at the end of the story, they even reach a place of equality and honour. But we will hear more about that next week. As I was considering Boaz and his actions, I was thinking of how his message is found throughout the Bible. Jesus' life consistently displayed this kind of extravagant blessing and generous love. He ate with sinners, restored the sick, and fed the poor. Then Jesus became the ultimate blessing to the nations through his death and resurrection, leaving us on this earth to be the people of God who now bless the nations. We are a people who are called to be radically generous, feeding the poor, widows, orphans, and foreigners and in every interaction, seeking to love foreigners as family. We aren't asked to live by the Levitical law anymore, but we are asked to love our neighbours as ourselves. And Boaz displays really practically how we can actively do this. But as Boaz also shows us, it will cost us. It might not be monetary, it might be time, or, you know, personal space, or countless other possibilities. I heard a scholar by the name of Brian K. Blount, who spoke the other day on a podcast, and he made a statement that really challenged me. He said, equality for all people is witnessing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Equality for all people is witnessing to the Lord Jesus Christ. What if the way we witness to the Lord Jesus Christ in this world is by seeking to be people of equality? And that doesn't mean equal for everyone. Clearly, Boaz was giving to Ruth because she was in need. He didn't ask her to pay for the food or the barley that she took. We are to be people who raise up those who have been oppressed. Equality in our current state is giving more to those who are suffering, those who are less privileged than us. And once again, it will cost us. And I'm not saying that you are to give away the little that you have if you have nothing. I'm saying that God asks us to do things that cost us to which it meets our present circumstance. It may mean we have to lower ourselves as an act of love. And when we treat people this way, we are witnessing to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are showing those around us the character, the fragrance of Christ. Boaz had one person in front of him who he showed extravagant generosity to. Who is the person in front of you? The stranger? the oppressed, the foreigner? Who is God asking you to lift up out of oppression? Not through your own power, but through the work of the Holy Spirit. 
Are we listening to what the spirit is asking of us as we interact with the supermarket checkout person, our colleagues at work, our employees, and our neighbours across the fence? How are you being a blessing to the nations as a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Creator God, Almighty Father, we desperately need you. We desperately need the work of your Spirit in each of our lives. Lord, open our eyes to see who is around us. Open our ears to hear where oppression is taking place, where unkindness is taking place. Lord, help us to hear ourselves in the way that we talk to people, in the way that we treat people. Lord, help us to be a people of generosity, a people who help to feed those who are in need. Lord, I pray that we would be a people who seek equality for all as a way of witnessing to your name, witnessing to your character. Lord, I pray that this year we would become more and more like you. Lord, that we would have the patience to stop, the time to give to people along the road. And Lord, that we would journey with you. Lord, we need you. We need your kindness and your generosity and your extravagant love. Lord, we pray that you would lavish that upon us so that we would have more to give. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for walking with us. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Sasha, that was a great summary of the story of Ruth and specifically Boaz. I always knew he was a special kind of guy, but I never even thought to read all those things into what happened in that story, how Boaz was generous, how he gave abundantly, and how he just, his hospitality, it was just, yeah, remarkable. And for me, it points straight to Jesus and to how we called to live in abundance with our hospitality, with our kindness, with our generosity towards our fellow human beings. Yeah, lovely. Thank you. I'll never look at Boaz the same again. What did you get out of that sermon? Let us know. Now, I would like to just remind you again about that fish and chips on the beach this afternoon. 4.30, Kariu Tahi, just outside Wahuku. It's probably a bit late now to organize a ride, but if you want to, you can contact me and I'll see what I can do. Or just join us, get your fish and chips or whatever you want to eat and join us for some great fun times on the beach tonight. See you then. I'd like to close our time together with this prayer from Mother Teresa. Beautiful prayer and it ties in so well with what we heard this morning. Dear Jesus, 
help me to spread thy fragrance everywhere I go. Flood my soul with thy spirit and love. Penetrate and possess my whole being so utterly that all my life may only be a radiance of thine. Amen.